listening to Muslimish Freethinkers, a podcast dedicated to fostering conversations on matters of faith and disbelief. talk this time. I mean, I don't always love your talk, but this, this specific talk was, I loved it, personally. And uh, there's just one thing that I wanted to ask you about, which when you're saying that religion is natural and science is not, which I thought I disagree with that. That's like, only, I love everything else except that one part. Mm-hmm. Because to me, I feel science is natural and religion is not. And uh, at least once you understand it, I mean, it takes a while to understand, but once, once you get an understanding of what science is, I think evolution, you look at, you know, chimpanzees and how similar they are to humans, that's, that's natural. It's just because, I mean, I think it's just because we've been conditioned to think that this is the natural way of things. That's why, that's why a, a story about a flying donkey seems to be, you know, the natural state, but it's not. It really is not. So what, what, why, do you, what do you, why do you think that... Religion is the natural state and not, uh, and not science. I, I feel like Zerar wants to answer this. Uh, I know, I, I thought I could. I just feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's not uh, my opinion. It is uh, something that when I heard, I heard uh, the author of this book speak uh, before, and then I purchased his book, and it made a lot of sense uh, to me. It's just, it just, it took me six months to understand the theory of evolution. Uh, I was an engineer, so I, I've never studied biology beyond grade nine. And I skipped evolution due to religious reasons. And I brought a paper from the sheikh to the, to the teacher uh, at that time. So I never really uh, understood evolution. And then the, if, if we are ever uh, uh, que- you know, uh, questioned about it, uh, in the Islamic environment, it's always like dismissive, very dismissive. Like, oh, this theory, yeah, it's old theory. Nobody believes in it. Make, you know, man came from monkey, and uh, it has been disproven. So when we were, when I was exposed to it, I had to. I we as a, and I was a member in an Islamic organization, and then we received the question uh, about Lucy. It was at the time where the research about Lucy has been finalized and published, two thousand eight. So, um, and I referred the question to the committee, and the committee had no idea um, what they're talking about. And I thought that would be embarrassing to publish their answer. So I thought, let me try to, uh, re, you know, redo the answer. And then it took me a while to understand what's going on. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to write an article about Islam and evolution. And what was supposed to be like a couple of days effort took me six months of daily studying and reading and then going to the University of Michigan nearby if I had like serious questions with professors and and uh, it deconstructed a lot of the things I knew. I had depression. I had a friend come from Ottawa to support me uh, because it was I, I was struggling a lot trying to understand something that is deconstructing a lot of the things that I used to uh, believe in before. But this process was not simple to just explain to my like young daughter or old mother or you know it's just not simple. So I understand you once you understand it, everything makes sense. It's like a key, and then everything like falls into place, and there's no conf- like you know the natural world, the biological world just makes sense. The model just works out beautifully. But but to get to that point. You know, like, you understand if I tell you there's a hundred people outside, there's a thousand people, there's a thousand, uh, you know, things. But once I tell you there's a 10 to the 32 planets in front of you, just the number doesn't make sense anymore. Like, our mind hasn't evolved. I'm, I'm just reflecting on my reading from the book, but you can read read it for more information. So, but, so, so science is just, it, it goes beyond our the need, the knowledge that we need for our daily life. 
So we're, we, it, is, it takes a little bit of effort. And it's a beautiful thing as humans that we can really comprehend. Uh, and then it can be simplified. I mean, the, Richard Dawkins wrote The Magic of Reality, right? As an effort to introduce science at a 15 years old level with illustrations, you know. Uh, but it takes an effort. While it's very simple to say that, uh, oh, there was, you know, a, a great power that's unseen uh, and it created us, you know, for it's just a story that we have naturally evolved to. Uh, and this has, I mean, it's a scientific talk. I feel I'm not qualified to answer the question. It's more like an evolutionary biologist should answer the question. Why did we evolve to, why may, uh, religion evolved with us? Uh, and we eventually, we're probably going to evolve out of it with scientific education effort, you know, that continues on. And there is, a, there is a historic thing also to it. I'm sorry, it's your topic, but it's, uh, if you look at the, uh, the caves where cavemen used to live thousands of years ago, you'd see draw, some of the ancient drawings that they actually had a god. They were, they were worshipping sun or they were worshipping whatever any force of nature before, way before they started uh, having any knowledge of science or you know, mathematics or biology. It, it's sort of, it's a, it's a need to protect yourself from the unknown. It's, it's, it comes before science. That, that, doesn't yeah. make, that doesn't make it more relevant, of course, but it makes it more, more, more logical. I mean, people need to protect themselves uh, by, by assuming there is something great out there, uh, creating us, helping us, protecting us. And then, you know, the uh, mathematics, the geometry, it, it, it all came later. And just to add to the point, so religion comes, well, what if you deconstruct religion, especially primitive religion, from which modern religions have evolved, it's really based on a combination of fear, causation, uh, fear of death, you know, uh, uh, when, when the primitive man used to uh, face the scary unknown, uh, like a, a storm or a hurricane or a tornado or uh, lightning or you know they used to try to interpret it with causation which we have evolved with because our ancestor who feared the causation of the uh, shaking of the bush survived being eaten by the lion for example and uh, you know so that causation uh, has evolved in us and we always seek the causes behind things it makes us more comfortable it removes fear for us. So this is where the basis of the primitive religion, and it just evolves. This is what I mean. I think that's what they mean by natural, uh, that it's something that we, we've evolved to believe in the, and who moved the bush, you know, uh, to remove our fear and to protect ourselves and to survive. So it comes natural to us. Uh, but, you know, then you have organized, organized religion, which is, you know, an offshoot of that. But... Uh, uh, Eventually, how can we, that's a struggle, for, I mean, that's why uh, I think uh, Richard Dawkins himself uh, had focused on, at a certain time of his life, on public, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> on public, uh, pu public perception of, uh, of science, because there's a discrepancy. So how do we, that's an effort of scientists, how do we make the public understand science? Because there's a big discrepancy. I think Zerar can also comment on this. Yes, I've been waiting. Thank you. <laughs> I've been so patient. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I really like the, the talk, and I, I like the thing that the, the book that you mentioned, and then you explained it in good detail. I, my immediate thought actually was, and looking at, at that slide, was actually thinking when I grew up, I actually felt that most people's religion seemed unnatural to me. And there were some that seemed natural. If I encountered certain people, certain thinkers, I felt it was natural. Uh, like the when I captured the Muthazala, who were like the I guess the group at the time back in the early days of Islam, who were all about uh, taking the Quran with reason and stuff. It, it seemed very intuitive to me. Um, but then with that though, there's some religions. that's very interesting that maybe in the West, religion by definition like separates you from the world. Like it's you, and then the divine is a separate thing. As you go east, it's interesting. Like in Hinduism, there's not supposed to be a separation. And the East, the Far East, they have, they actually view, uh, so science is also like naturalism, it's called, like the study of the natural world. 
And so that's a real big, big thing in the East. And so, uh, yeah, it just made me wonder whether different people would approach science differently. Maybe there's something that we grow up with in the West that makes it seem like science is so uh, unnatural, but 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 by def- first by definition, science is based. That's what's funny. Science by definition is based on the natural world, which, which should make it natural. And then in some traditions, that's what that, that's how you view religion is based on the natural world. And so, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you, you've encountered that. Like different, it's not only religion is unnatural, but you might we might find certain people's religion is unnatural to you. That sounds really harsh, but I don't know if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think we're using the word natural also yeah. in, in multiple dimensions. Yeah, maybe like unintuitive. Like so. Yeah. Doesn't that mean that it isn't evolutionary religion? Well, if you grew up here, another. Religion. Oh yes, yeah, I was trying to think as you talked. Huh. But if somebody else's religion from the East is different, and you don't find it natural, then doesn't that sort of come up with the whole evolution part of it? I'm just, uh, I just like to give these questions to specialists. So you, you, don't, oh, okay. Sorry. you know, so my topic was more of Islamic reform. I, I don't want to comment a lot about, uh, um, you know, evolutionary biology because it's not my specialty. <laughs> Clarify that thing. I think what was saying just meant is that for most people, their religion is more natural to them than science is. So when they encounter science, it seems very natural. That's, that's, that's what I do. Yeah, well, I, uh, I liked all of the presentations. Very different. I uh, have a few comments. Um, let me say, um, well, two things. One, um, you gave us some historical sources. You mentioned a book that you're preparing, um, Middle Quran, was it? And if is that available? When would it be available? It sounds it's like already somebody... published and available, but it's not available on like Amazon. Right. But through you, through Muslims? Yeah, uh, no, it's through a different organization. Okay, but you can help us find it? Sure. And related to that, maybe um, Muslimish or you could offer some simple <laughs> resources. Uh, I've spoken to a number of imams. They're almost all almost all immigrants, all, and but even even African American, they're very knowledgeable. I can never, I can't talk to them. Um, to Women in particular, um, I, I know many people will know her, Fatima Mernisi, and then here in the States, I think it's McLeod, Amina McLeod, I think are doing some very good analytical work, but also pointing out things that I can relate to uh, as trying to understand um, and not reject everything about my faith. Um, now on the question, so uh, it's interesting, I find that those two people I mentioned are women. Um, I just have a thing about a lot of male teachers and especially our Arab people and you pointed out the rhetoric that they use which is also in the Quran and they're trained I guess to talk like that and that is, I just shut down. And I think a lot of other people do, if I'm trying to listen to them. And um, I don't know what we do about that, except get a whole new bunch of imams and maybe some women in the in the system. Um, um, then the, the question uh, finally of uh, the effort you you said is required by you to relate evolution and Islam in your case. And I'm just finding within Islam, I have to work very, very hard. I did not grow up uh, with Quran. I only grew up with a few prayers and references, but no real practice. So I depend on English translations, number one. And apart from my age, it takes a lot of effort to try to break through. You know, I am not willing 
to reject um, Allah, frankly. I'm not willing. Khalil talked about, you talked about um, the music of Islam and the art, and then you decided it's a, like, a painkiller. And it may, may be, did you say that? Oh, oh. And, but let me just finish briefly, that uh, it's not a pain, I don't feel it's a painkiller for me. Somehow it connects me with life outside me. So I'll just... Just, just to clarify that, I'm an artist, uh, so I use art and music and all that stuff. I was talking about Sufism, mm -hmm. not, right. not music and art. I understand. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Was it wasn't a question. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. Uh, it's not really a comment. It's more. Uh, I mean, it's not a question. It's more of a continuation of the uh, comment by Ibrahim regarding the the religion and the science being one being more natural, uh, and the other one is is less natural. So uh, we we are humans and we are evolved with with stories and stories give us the model of the universe and when we refer to science some people actually uh, confuse the word science with different uh, definitions science when we talk about science is referred to the scientific method of discovery and depiction of the natural world but for most people when they hear science they just mean that some new scientific research that just they see on internet and sometimes new research study overrides uh, the old one. So they say, oh, you know, the science is, it's just, we, we can't trust science. So that's one thing. Second thing is, uh, when you look at the human society, the scientists are a tiny fraction of the whole society. So, um, for example, if you look at the American society, one of the Western most advanced societies, if you take a general consensus of this, the American society, more than 80% of Americans belong to a certain religion. And if you go to the scientific community, that this percentage goes down significantly uh, to 40%. And if you take it to the elite scientists, when we say elite scientist, somebody who's a PhD in science and having more than two research papers published in a reputed peer-reviewed journal uh, more than twice a year, the, the elite body of the American Scientific Council, more than 93% of them identify themselves as atheist or agnostic. But still, there are 7% of the elite scientists of America, they belong to a certain religion. So, in, uh, in words of Dr. Tyson, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he says, before we talk to a common person, why do you believe in religion? We should not. We have no right to talk to a common person before we go to those elite scientists and ask their reasoning, try to understand why such a sophisticated mind is still believing in those primitive stories. We cannot argue with a common person. We cannot just understand the reason they need such, such stories. So, uh, my point is, this is quite complicated. It's not as scientific as, as we think it is. Human mind definitely needs its reasons to believe in those stories and uh, a simplified model of the universe. Thank you. Thank you. I should just point out, in science, there's interesting, there's certain fields that end up being more religious. There's some fields that no one really ends up being religious. So I think it's physics, especially theoretical. And mathematics often it's like more likely. I, I, yeah. Thanks, Sudan. Yes, I have a question about the um, reformation of Islam. Certainly, an argument could be made that the process by which Christianity has increasingly secularized itself over the centuries and uh, introduced questioning of certain Christian scriptures. And this process that you mentioned, whereby Christians say, you know, with those things, we can kind of leave that scripture alone, but this scripture is more important. There's, uh, there could be an argument, man, I'm sure many people make it, that to do that with Islam, 
as progressive as it would be, as much as that would bring about where many would argue would be a much needed um, reformation within the faith, that that could potentially leave the faith open to certain pitfalls that Christianity has already succumbed to, namely the decline of religious adherence to the faith, decline of the influence of the faith in the world. And I tend to think that the, the tendency, which is my understanding, which is extremely limited by my own ambition, that there's this idea within Islam that it is at the very least preferable if as many people in the world as possible were to convert to Islam compared to other faiths. So, you know, Christianity, there is this evangelical tradition of preaching the gospel, but it's kind of like, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, it's almost as if there's a progression from Judaism, which is very insular, you know, it's Jews and Gentiles, to Christianity, which everyone is welcome, to Islam, where it seems to be the case that, you know, we would really, really, really prefer it if everyone were Muslim, maybe a thousand, ten thousand years from now. And opening Islam up to the same sort of reformative mechanisms that Christianity has um, accommodated would potentially compromise that possibility. Uh, specifically, I tend to think that the, the nature of Islam and the way that Islamic societies are organized give Muslims bigger and fuller families than everyone else in the world, demographically speaking. So what would you say to someone who would make that argument that a reformation, a reformation within Islam would lead to a decline of Islamic fullness and that it, that should actually be avoided to avoid some of the, the things that Christianity is running to? Well, there's definitely pitfalls in the reformation of Islam, but uh, the non-reformation of Islam has the greater uh, risk uh, for Islam itself, and is struggling uh, with that. Um, right now, there is a there there is a there is a clash of uh, 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 new sectarianism. There are uh, new formulation of groups, and there is also a movement of uh, of leaving Islam, of secularism, which is not necessarily. Um, uh, a bad thing, but uh, it's uh, sometimes it's not based really on uh, on a, a different uh, understanding. It's just based on re being repelled away from uh, from uh, religion, which might lead to uh, a formulation of different kind of uh, uh, cults or, or uh, you know religions or uh, new forms of uh, uh, spiritual circles, which you know it's, it creates a a more danger and risk on the Islamic society than uh, intellectual-led uh, reform uh, movement. Um, and also, it, uh, the resistance to reformation is just leading to more extremism uh, because the extremism is, is, is holding on more fundamentally uh, to the uh, core uh, practice of religion uh, in resistance to the, to the pressure of reform. So and uh, there's a third risk which we 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 was one of the reasons that Muslim is established is that there is this choice between either being within Islam or completely stripping oneself from Islam and all its culture related cultures. You'll find an individual who would leave completely, change name and just rip themselves completely away from the culture as a runaway. They just run away from Islam and everything. And that is, has, has a lot of suffering uh, attached to it. And um, so uh, you have, we have to uh, support the voice of reformation within Islam because it's the only natural thing. Other, otherwise, that buildup of pressure will e either result in violence or a deformation really, of, of, the, of, of religion, which we're seeing, for example, in Iraq, uh, the amount of uh, new sects and uh, after the fall of Saddam and this, the, the open, free uh, environment for, for interpretation and 
uh, you know, movement within uh, dynamic movement within Islam has has shown us what what can this happen. You, there used to be like one or two or three Islamic thoughts or ideologies. Now there's hundreds within the uh, the cities of uh, of Iraq. So, uh, summary of the answer of your question is that there is some. Uh, uh, compromises that the Muslim society has to pay for the sake of ref reformation, uh, the compromises will be much higher if they resist it. Do you have any comments? Um, no, I think I'll uh, just emphasize the point that you just said. Uh, we're seeing a clash right now. It's uh, either if you're a fundamentalist and you're looking at what the, where the world is going, there is a clash between your beliefs, practices, and the, the natural course of humanity. So it's either you reform or you will be in, in constant violence and war with the, with the rest of the world. So it has to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, this is a question directed towards Wassam, but you know, Khalil and Ali, you're also more than free to jump in. Before Wassam, you're finishing your presentation, and I think towards the last slide, you were talk, you're trying to talk about Islamic nationalism. Can you please clarify a bit more on that? So in summary, because this was like the second section of the talk, uh, and I know that I'm not going to have time to get there, but I put it as just a uh, yeah, it's a precaution. Um, in summary, so uh, there is, sometimes Islam is taken a form of national. I'll give you an example. Um, when the Muslims protest uh, the cartoons of the Prophet, as far as religion is concerned, the cartoons of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, is as blasphemous in Islam as cartoons against Prophet Isa, as uh, writings against God. You know. So why pick and choose and only react to such, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, such a, you know, an incident? Rather than so, because sometimes it is not really about what religion is what the religion says, it is a, a nationalistic reaction, that this is, uh, you know, we, we are being attacked as people rather than and what, is, what we hold dire. So the mix between Islam and, and nationalism can uh, complicate the, the dialogue with, with Islam. I like what Ibrahim said in his presentation when he said that when, uh, if Muslims are going to be put in concentration camp, then I'm a Muslim, because then it is really about, uh, and he said, because they are my people. So there is, uh, I know it is, it, is, it is very clear the effect of the nationalization of Judaism, right? I mean, uh, that's uh, a whole theme within the, the movement of the uh, Jewish history. But in Islam, it is not really clear cut. But sometimes you see it, you see it in, in such reactions where it is really about them attacking us. Um, uh, one of the things we wanted to do as Muslimish, uh, because we are a voice from within Islam, we're probably accepted more within our societies uh, than if uh, um, a speaker who is foreign to um, uh, Muslims is speaking to them directly, uh, they will probably think this is, oh, this is a, a plan, coming back to conspiracy theory, it's a Zionist plan to uh, take over, or it's an attack on Islam. But if a Muslim is from within their community uh, speaking to them about uh, the need of, you know, questioning Islam or reforming Islam or whatever it is, uh, they will accept it more because there is less national uh, identity uh, clash in that sense. So there's more to that, but that's in summary what I was going to say. Yeah, just going back to the, that gentleman's question, uh, you know, regarding the changing Islam, um, couldn't you look at it in this perspective? That basically all ideologies change over time. They must, um, just because of the exigencies of life. The Jews of 2019 are not the Jews of biblical times. Two groups probably wouldn't have, want to have anything to do with each other, um, and and that's what that's what I'm thinking. So, uh, fundamental it seems to me the fundamentalist elements of any group are going to want to cling to what they believe is the golden past. Somebody told me many years ago that every society 
remembers a golden age that never was. And so you, you find you find Hasidic Jews, and they look at it this way. You find uh, the Sunnis look at it another way of what they consider the real Islam, the real Jews, and the real past, the real Christianity. But a hundred years after Christianity started, it was not most definitely not the religion of Jesus Christ. It some, became something else. So I'm just wondering if that that's more looking at it in that perspective would be more positive and helpful. Yeah, I mean, definitely, thank you. I mean, I will take this as a comment, definitely. Yeah, this is a natural progression. Uh, people are in denial sometimes. It's growing pains, we all do it. Right. For, for lots of yeah. reasons. And this is about really cre creating an environment where people accept that yeah. Uh, yeah. safely without, you know, removing the fears and threats right. uh, of that. So thank you guys for uh, your talks. So they were very. I always like the Spanish conferences because uh, whenever I can see something from a different perspective, it always makes me very happy. Um, the question I have is for uh, both Khalid and Ali uh, regarding conspiracy theories. So I think um, uh, what I was thinking about was uh, you mentioned something, Khalid, about in your hometown there was just numerous numbers of, of uh, young people who were recruited into ISIS, and I'm wondering. Um, I can imagine that there's some conspiracy theories that played a role, so I'm wondering if there was um, uh, anything that you heard or, or, or anything that, uh, like the recruiting strategy, is essentially, is what I'm wondering about. And then the, the other question is for Ali, which is, uh, when it comes to conspiracy theories, especially nowadays, uh, if you type in, if you have any idea about anything and you just type it into Google, you will find some document that confirms that idea. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, this is the, even for us scientists, when, when we know that, that, you know, there are credible sources that you can trust or whatever, we still have to scrutinize those sources. So I'm wondering, uh, how do you approach that or, or what would you recommend? Um, conspiracy, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a fact in our community. I mean, we have it in our mind, it's natural. Um, it's um, so yeah. Those those numerous people that they get recruited um, in the mosques to go to uh, ISIS. I've been there, like in some some uh, durus, which is like lessons that they give after salat to the prayers. Was uh, when I was a kid, but I didn't, I didn't totally understand it um, by telling you that jihad is a part of our religion and. Uh, there's, there are like they, like, you know, um, to be more specific in Tunis, um, they tell them like, for example, Americans and Yehud or, or Zionists are attacking the Islam and Islam is in danger. Um, I remember, I remember in the, in the first election after the revolution, um, there is this, uh, film, like short film was diffused on one of the national TVs. It was, uh, translated. And one of the characters in this cartoon was um, presenting God. And I remember like every Tunisian was in the street calling to stop this channel. Um, and because of that, they, were, they started this um, conspiracy um, concept or, 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 or notion in their mind. And they were like, Islam in danger, so we have to vote to the Islamic part. And that's why they get um, the power, uh, but also there is something else, um, which is the emotions, the emotions and helping um, those kids um, in, 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 in the mosques or, or in the universities or in schools. Um, whenever they find a student or, or someone like needs help or needs money, they, they go for it. They first help him. Uh, and then I, I remember like a small story short, like story. It was like a guy who, who doesn't have any money and he just get out of jail. Um, and they started like giving him money. Um, like I know, I know him personally. So it was like, he got this, um, salary, uh, and he wasn't doing any job. He was just going with them and talking to them and learning from them after like three months. He became with a bar and like, you know, the hurka, like the, um, the dress and all that stuff. And, 
and um, they stopped paying him. So I remember the fight that he <laughs> that he had with this group. Like, why do you guys stop paying me? And um, and yeah, it's just just uh, that's what I have. Yes, I couldn't talk. Uh, thank you for your question. It's uh, actually the 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 only way to. Uh, to counter the uh, conspiracy theory model is simply to verify. You talked about scientific approach. Uh, basically, go for the facts because um, in conspiracy theory that even if they provide some facts or they, that would look like facts uh, in any argument, if you go beyond step one and two and try to verify, you will end up with with nothing. For instance, if you talk about the uh, the nine eleven. We're just talking about how, how the towers fell. And a lot of people would say, I mean, you cannot have the towers fall because of the burning of the fuel. It, the, the, the fuel burns, let's say, around 900 Celsius. And for the steel, steel structure, you need something more or above than 1100 Celsius. Well, if you go to the, to the engineering uh, part of that, it's simply you're, you're becoming more elastic. The, 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 the steel structure is not designed to be to have to carry that weight in an elastic mode under a 900 centi Celsius uh, fire. So basically what's happening is it's, it's bending, bending slowly, and then it's falling from above to, to below, to the bottom. And the other thing is, the other argument for instance, I'm just giving examples on how to, to verify. Uh, uh, they say it's a, it's a controlled uh, bombing. You look, look at how it fell. I mean, basically, go and watch two videos of a controlled demolition of a, of a building and look at how the, the towers fell. The tower fell from top to bottom and controlled a demolition. It's the, the lower floors, actually, they blow, blow up and then the rest will fall, will fall on, on top. What happened is the, exactly the opposite. Uh, I read one of the uh, stories that talked about uh, the the theory of there was actually no plane in the Pentagon, no one attacked the Pentagon. So, uh, and they were quoting a CNN reporter and the name was there and the quote was there. Okay, anyone who would just stop at this level, they would say, oh my God, I mean, we have someone who talked and then it just got, you know, buried somewhere. But if you go and verify, the guy never said that. If you go and find, try to find a verified, reliable source, he never said that. He never said that. I. You know, I, know, I never saw a, a, a plane or the, the grass is intact, it was not burned. So go beyond, beyond level one or level, level two. When I was at the, at the times in Baghdad, we usually, I mean, for instance, we get a, something from the Ministry of Interior and we'll be asked to verify it from another source. So we'll have at least, at least two independent sources to verify that. So it's not just sources, science, Science plays a big role in this because what we just talked about, people would just think, okay, you know, science says that you cannot, uh, you cannot burn the, the towers. Well, it, it could happen scientifically. It, it is possible. And uh, I talked to the author of one of the, one of the books written about the 9-11, uh, the and he visited the site several times. He has a PhD in physics, and he said there was no traces of dynamite whatsoever. There was no traces of bombing whatsoever. Plus the logic of you know having hundreds of employees that if you have that order coming from top to bottom, how many people do you need to carry that out and you know keep the secret? I think it's yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be almost impossible to keep the secret secret like that. Thank you. I just want to add one point to this uh, that we have also an issue since you're talking about science verification. Uh, the commercialization of research. So you'll have research done by by uh, a you know a group in college or something, and then you'll have an article written to uh, state the results of the research. But this article, that the title of the article, the way it's written, it uh, it uh, it changes the, the 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 results of the article just by using different kind of words. Uh, in order for them to get more readability to it. And I think that hurts us a lot, hurts science a lot, uh, the way you know they try to dramatize the results of their... Sometimes it's just a simple correlation. 
between, let's say, uh, boldness and uh, uh, libido. And then the article comes out to be, oh, bold men have more libido. You know, it's, it's nothing to do with the results, the scientific results, uh, but they use it to, to just create a, a dead commercialization of, now I have a habit when I see an article like this, I actually click on the research to read what the actual research was, and I, I have a different understanding of it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll, I guess, draw to a close. I was going to add one comment to uh, what Elvie's conspiracy thing is. I don't know if anyone's seen that. The South Park has an episode about the 9-11 conspiracies, and I'll just give the episode away, but it's pretty funny. So they, they try to find out where the conspiracy comes from, and it's kind of like from Dick Cheney and the government. And it's because the government wants you to think that they are powerful enough to do something like this. <laughs> and so I feel like it, it goes back to the dictator comment, too. And, and, but yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so we'll have a closing statement. I think uh, Ali or was, uh, Ibrahim or uh, the Sam will give it. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, right afterwards, if you could just quickly leave, and then if you're going to converse, you can converse on the bridge or where we ate the tables there, uh, as we have to leave this area um, by uh, 5.30. I uh, just want to say thank you so much for coming to the conference today. Uh, I feel that, well, I want to thank everyone personally because I think your participation is very important to us. Uh, we are a small group still, even after years of having regular meetings in New York and five other cities. And I think having people come to our conference is very encouraging to us. Um, I feel Muslimish is one of the few places within the Muslim community where we can have this conversation among themselves. I'm very happy with, with the participation today, uh, that everyone said their opinion, and, and we, I think we had a good discussion. I'm, I'm really happy with that. A lot of great ideas. Uh, and that's what we want to continue to do. So um, again, I want to remind everyone with the goals of the group, because you know, I'm goal driven and I want everybody to know what the goals are because I don't want someone to come six years later and tell me, well, what are the goals? The goals are three goals to create a place for discussion, to foster a plural society, and to abolish blasphemy laws. We want to give the freedoms that we have here to everyone in the Muslim world to so be able to discuss their most, the clothing, you know, the most important. Uh, reason de terre, the, the, the reason of existence. It's the most core question that. Everyone asks themselves, why are we here? To be able to discuss that and, and talk about it. Um, again, there's still some food out here in the corner, so we, 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 we don't want it to get uh, spoiled, so please grab a sandwich. And we have a uh, happy hour. We're going uh, to uh, Treadwell Park, so please join us for a drink. Or not, or, or, or yeah. But, uh, <laughs> or, or, or not haram drink. You, can, you always can get a seltzer cranberry. So, uh, Please join us. Thank you so much again for coming, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Muslimish Freethinkers. Do let us know what you think of this episode at facebook.com forward slash muslimish. Don't forget to visit us at muslimish.org.